This is The Lack with Helen Rollins, Benjamin Studebaker, and Nina Power. Today, we're talking about the documentary Arcadia, and the theme is nature. Helen, kick us off. Um, yes, I have a various array of things to say. I will talk a little bit about um, the type of film that this is, and then about the film itself, and also about the sort of maybe nature of subjectivity and how it relates to, or our nature of subjectivity and how it relates to this kind of film. I really appreciate this kind of film. It's very much in the same vein as Ziga Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera, one of my favorite films. Um, so I do like these almost supra rational, supra intellectual, visceral montage documentaries. I like them a lot. And I think they do something slightly different to. Uh, more conventional narrative films, and I'll kind of compare them. Um, but what, one thing I wanted to talk about as well is um, woke art. <laughs> Obviously, a film like this is, um, I think they deliberately, I watched an interview with the filmmakers, they were talking about they're trying to, exp as if, it, you know, thinking about the fact that they're not trying to be literal, they're not trying to verbally explain something, but trying to explain to an alien what Britain was. So trying to get beyond possibly the symbolic register, beyond language. And so when something is less explicit, obviously there are undercurrents um, of ideological uh, ideology one way or another, often always perhaps in, in art, but this less, uh, a less explicit sort of hammering over your, you over the head with something, which we often see today, um, I think is important. Woke art, I think is um, bad for very many reasons, obviously because it is just um, explicitly capitalist ideology but um apart from that it can be quite fun to critique and also it helps us you know we can we can analyze society through the lens of its cultural products you know the cultural products give us some information about what's going on so they're doing us a favor in a way but art really is about exploration it's about foreground and contradiction it's about alphabetization am i saying it's probably alphabetization alphabetization in a winnicottian sense this is what you go to psychoanalysis for subjectivization digestion so you're coming to terms with something obviously societies change you know we don't live in the 1750s anymore we're in the 2020s you know life changes and we don't know where it's going the owl of minerva and all that but what is inevitable is change and change isn't wrong per se you know um there can be good dynamics with various various material manifestations, you know, in, in any kind of setup. But the thing that's that's bad potentially is um, the inability to come to terms with the change, and then we get the re return of the repressed. So when you know, let's say we get a woke anger at uh, a reactionary outburst from a section of society that the woke aspect doesn't appreciate perhaps it is because they haven't been uh, the, the woke has taken upon uh, the woke section of society has taken upon itself to to create castigatory finger pointing consciousness raising quote unquote art instead of a place where um people can experience changes subjectifies changes subjectively explore changes and come to terms with it my um i just got a new niece who was born last week and my nephew, who is two years and 10 months, um, is, you know, met the child two days ago, three days ago. And it was really, I wasn't there because I'm in a different country, but seeing it on screen, it's really interesting to see the ambivalence, the like normal and natural ambivalence of a child where you both, he's both excited that his sister's there, but also, you know, has a bit of trepidation um, about the fact that, you know, he's, he, he's not potentially the king on his throne in this little family anymore. There's got to be space for somebody else. And there's, there's always this ambivalence and there's ways that you can help them come to terms with it. So for instance, I bought him a little personalized, this sounds so cheesy, but I think it's important, um, superhero outfit. Because he is the super big, he's called Ramon, we call him Ray, super big Ray, you know, he's taking on this new role. So obviously in, in different societies and different ways, there are um, rites of passage as, as things change and transform. And these help you um, digest and come to terms with symbolize, bring to the symbolic order. And it's interesting this film is, takes the root, not of a riven um, narrative that's very, um, you know, uh, let's say rational or whatever. It's, it's deliberately messy, but in a way, sometimes it's the messiness that can help us raise that which is messy to the, to the point of sort of consciousness in a way. Um, yeah, so it's when we, 
in order to accept changes, we have to be able to explore our ambivalence and to subjectify the change. And interestingly, I don't know if you guys like Lana Delroy, some of my um, very, uh, let's say, professional people I know who work in pop music probably thinks it's, think it's hashtag cringe, but I, I like Lana Del Rey, what can I say? Um, and she has a new song called Arcadia, interestingly, um, that came out. And Arcadia is a, a, a town, sort of a suburb town in the greater LA area, quite a, you know, gritty Americana type town, let's just say, you know, uh, one of these, a bit like Anaheim or something like that. Um, and it's a very nostalgic piece of music. You know, it's, it's looking at this, potentially an era that never was. I think um, people sometimes think Lana Del Rey has that sort of, um, you know, unwoke essence to her, but this is obviously not a reactionary song in any way. The nostalgia helps us subjectivize something that was lost perhaps that never was, but the subjectivization through art helps us move forward. So the, as I said, this film is doing something different. I just want to like tag on an idea about the nature or unnature of subjectivity related to this. So I'm very interested in how film, the rhythm narrative of narrative forms of film can um, hook our desire, lead us by desire. So we have this train track narrative where somebody who is lacking something goes on a quest to achieve something, in any kind of form or a group of people. And then at the point of revelation, that fantasy is undercut. I think that's really the sort of emancipatory potential of conventional narrative. Um, and this hitches a ride, this we can we can use film to hitch a ride on the um, denatured nature of subjectivity. Our second birth distorts our subjectivity so that we always experience the lack of the universe at the level of our subjectivity. You know, we are unlike the rock or unlike the dog that don't experience their division. And as I said, this is a more of a, a supernatural, supernatural, so supra intellectual form, you know, beyond the intellect. Um, in a way that's quite similar to the Ziga uh, Vertov movie, Man with a Movie Camera, it has quite a collective um, dynamic to it, a collective nature. Because it's not really concretely saying, but showing, there's sort of an ambivalence baked into the film itself. It means many things to many people potentially. So, you know, this kind of reflects the infinity of the unconscious. The unconscious is not an essential thing, but an, an infinite nothing, an infinite rupture. And I think this is part of the problem with the sort of um, vulgarized, I wouldn't say vulgarized actually, because I think vulgarized um, psychoanalysis is better than say, a like a critical theory university liberal arts version of psychoanalysis, which maybe tells students that, that the unconscious is an essence or sort of a balance that there's a potential cosmic balance within the unconscious or subconscious, but there actually isn't, you know, it's all, it's all of a level. It's all, you know, within the same plane and there's no essence of the unconscious. It is just rupture as such. It reminded me a little bit of um, the doors of perception essay by Aldous Huxley. And I think, I mean, I could be wrong, but I feel like his writings potentially touch on that sort of um, a, 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 an idea of psychoanalysis that I don't really agree with, that I wouldn't call psychoanalysis, but he has this idea of por a portal. And I like this idea of um, the, uh, the, the archive footage being this portal to an infinite unconscious. So sort of these layers of meaning within an archive, because it's not, because there's a distance between us, there's a shared sort of historical memory, but a distance. The greater the distance between sort of a, a material representation in the here and now, the more sort of layers of meaning, the more infinite interpretations that sort of evolve over time. So there's something like ambivalent, like mini kaleidoscopes built into archive footage as such. And it's, it's interesting that obviously the archive footage has a sort of this denatured essence to its essence and that, you know, the wear and tear or the, the shakes or the kind of um, black and whiteness and the distortion, that it adds something quote unquote artistic, like, archive footage is nice and visually nice to sort of use in a piece of work um, and I think it's artistic in its essence because it it does reflect this kind of complication distortion distance that is to do with art itself that art is this place for the exploration of the ambivalent the contradictory so you know maybe archives are like an archival multiverse um I just want to, yeah, so I'm just saying here, perhaps that the point of what I take in psychoanalysis is not, so there's a materialism of the unconscious, but the unconscious itself has no essence. The nature is no essence. Oh yeah, but the, the last thing I'd uh, just like to say is in terms of um, Roland Barthes talks about the readly text and the writerly text. 
and um, maybe a difference between emancipatory narrative cinema versus maybe emancipatory exploratory documentaries is this idea of the readly and the writerly. So there's sort of a, a hierarchy perhaps in terms of the artistry from Abati's perspective of the readly and the writerly text. The writerly text, it involves the reader, you know, gets them to sort of project and to write the narrative within their mind as they read. And I think this, in a way, this the um, unclear nature of a film like this makes it writerly and that perhaps documentaries uh, do better to be rightly. We don't want to be sort of told at it, uh, talked at it, this sort of um, consciousness raising, quote unquote, I'm going to say this word in a derogatory sense over and over now, um, versus the, I think, a, a narrative film, um, it accesses the best of it when it's actually readily, when it really does everything to hook us in and um, take us by the hand, take our desire by the hand to really lock us into this train track to then suddenly rip the um, libidinal investment from beneath us. I kind of like that about, about narrative film. Um, yeah, and I think it is interesting that documentaries that, that include the poetic to get to a point of beyond pure consciousness. I think that the um, narrative uh, film, as I've said, operates in kind of a completely different level, even though I don't think documentary and fiction as such or non-fiction and fiction are like that far apart in terms of what they do with storytelling but um yeah I think it is it's nice when documentary films leave a space um and I think they're at their best when they leave a space to to explore um on the part of the reader uh, the viewer sort of a writerly viewer um I was going to say something yeah I can't remember where that was going, but yeah, there's sort of these different elements that maybe the best of cinema is the writerly documentary and the readerly narrative film. Um, and there is a thought there that I will come back to later because I was in the tip of my tongue and I can't remember. So there you go. All right. Well, we'll hear more from Helen later. For now, it's Nina's turn. <clears throat> right. Yeah, so Arcadia, I um, I really, really like this film. Um, and I first went to see it with my friend Laura, who's an excellent artist and kind of loosely in the uh, psychogeography side of um, kind of things like both in her writing and her art. And we often go on lots of walks together, um, just proper derives and just to imbibe um, either the city or nature, depending on where we, we are. And I was really struck by this, this film when we went to see it, and I didn't know anything about it. She suggested it. And when we came out of the cinema, we both felt this kind of um, feeling, like that there was a possibility to be able to talk about this aspect of, uh, if you like, folk... Um, or rural, but not only rural tradition within Britain. Um, and the footage depicts a variety of different uh, festivals and celebrations and rituals, some, some much older and some more, um, I suppose, constructed. Uh, so it includes kind of 90s rave footage and uh, there's a kind of a, a turn in the, the film where Thatcherism happens and, Britain becomes kind of disjointed, um, industrialized, but kind of post-industrialized. And um, there's a kind of very strong folk horror element to the film. Um, and they, they use uh, pieces of footage from fictional horror films to depict something of a kind of unnatural turn. Um, so even though the rituals and the kind of various um, footage obviously depicts sort of socially constructed rites and performances. And they do this palimpsest thing where the dance um, maps on. So like the dance from like 1890 is like the dance from 1990. And that you get this kind of uh, idea that there's some kind of tradition, however strange um, that's kind of going on even unconsciously or particularly uh, unconsciously through the land. And I think the, the thing that really struck me perhaps the most about this film is, was Although it's um, ambivalent and open-ended and it doesn't um, seek to be um, didactic in any way, 
Um, precisely for that reason, I think it opens up a possibility of a conversation which is often quite shut down on the left, which is to do with how we talk about things like the land and tradition. Um, and this film even has kind of intertitles that say things like, um, you know, the blood in the soil, which for some is rather uncomfortably close. Uh, you know, right wing rhetoric about uh, where people are from and the idea that there's a link between a people and a place. And I think that the left often shy away very um, severely from any discussion about place and roots and tradition and rights because of the fear that the moment you start to do those things, that's the territory, as it were, of the right. And so that the left has to, in a way, be on the side of a certain kind of cosmopolitan, metropolitanism, a kind of uh, modernism, um, even though capitalist modernity is, is horrific and, <laughs> and sort of deracinating and alienating. Nevertheless, any attempt to talk again about, or talk about ritual and tradition and place and folk um, will be a dodgy thing dear plow a lot so that that was one of the things that really struck me that this is part of a discussion about the commons um which is part of uh, the left but is often kind of uh, placed at one remove so when people talk about communism they forget to talk about the commons often and this is a point made by Cafensis and Federici and others in that kind of midnight notes um tradition that communism is not um, strictly or straightforwardly on the side of um, in, in industry, but is at the same time also and always about reclaiming the land in a kind of um, much uh, gentler um, way, you know, and I think a lot of the left is, is kind of obsessed with these ideas of full automation and technology and machines and, and robots and strip mining on Mars and, you know, this kind of really, tr you know, transhumanist, totally technophilic left, um, which I think is trajectory, but it's very, very dominant, like lots of the Verso authors are in this kind of um, vein. And, and I think uh, increasingly think that this is sort of taking us away from a kind of humanist uh, Marxism or any kind of um, recognition of um, the ways in which actually there are forms of collective belonging to which people can join and be added, like Rave was extremely um, open in that sense. It wasn't kind of uh, exclusive. It was a kind of a genuinely Dionysian popular cultural movement um, that many people participated in. Um, but that it does have a, a, a kind of revelation of, of place and land. And the fact that we are not only kind of um, alienated, distracted, uh, you know, anti-natural beings who have been kind of colonized by, by capital, but the, in the land and, and without these things, we can't survive, um, you know, it, or that our life will be um, um, absolutely um, sort of destroyed um, without nature. And I think you have footage of, of them interviewing a man in the shopping center and you know the interviewer are, it's, a, it's a slightly spurious glib question but it's it's kind of like you know would you mind if you never heard birds again if you never saw a tree and the man is like yes that would be fine you know and, and it kind of presents this idea of what, what it might be like to live in a fully kind of um, um, technologized or kind of industrialized or um, I don't know towny <laughs> universe um, so I think what, what it does, uh, to my mind at least, or amongst other things, is present this kind of um, possible way of rethinking nature, land, place, um, communal activity um, in a way that is actually really quite, um, quite striking. And, you know, that it may involve kind of rethinking um, these states of delirium, you know, they use the Alice in Wonderland um, idea about sort of just falling into the rabbit hole and sort of rethinking um, where you are. Um, and I think this is kind of, um, yeah, I don't know, just, I just find really quite, uh, quite moving and quite brave actually to do that, you know, knowing that they were kind of running the risk of sort of pissing off 
anyone who thinks that you shouldn't talk about land or nature because these things are the preserve of the right um, feeling about about this this film. All right, so now I'm up. Arcadia is a non-narrative documentary. It's a bit like a visual album. It flits between scenes of pagan rituals, village life, and industrial conflict. At a few different points, a narrator intervenes, but these interventions feel like vocal samples on what is otherwise an ambient album. They are not there to assert the claims they make, but to contribute to the atmosphere of the thing. I found Arcadia a meditative experience. As I watched the film, my mind drifted around, considering the relationship between humanity and the natural from many angles. At several points, the narrator asserts that the truth is in the soil. I thought about what that might mean and whether I agreed with the different interpretations I came up with. Whenever I think about nature, the first thing that collapses is the distinction between humanity and nature itself, and therefore, to some degree, the distinction between the artificial and the natural. Human beings are part of nature, and the things humans make are not external to the natural world. What we call the natural world is the product of the life of organisms. Soil itself is a byproduct of life. It's something living things make, something they manufacture. In my backyard in Indiana, there lives a woodchuck. In all probability, there have been many woodchucks in the backyard over the years, but I've always pretended the woodchuck I am seeing is the same woodchuck I saw when I was a boy. In those days, the woodchuck had a burrow in the ground. Woodchucks build magnificent burrows with little access holes. In the autumn, my brother and I would collect apples from the apple trees in our front yard. We'd pour them into the burrow through one of the holes. What if the woodchuck woke up during the winter? We didn't want him to be cold and hungry. We wanted him to have apples. One day, my parents decided they wanted to tame the backyard. They got a landscaper to come out and turn much of it into plots where my mother could plant the specific plants she wanted. The plants my mother wanted were not especially competitive plants. They'd struggle to deal with the native trees and grasses. So my parents brought in 30 cubic yards of mulch on a big dump truck. They dumped the mulch in the front yard and then moved it into the backyard with wheelbarrows and ATVs. Every year, the mulch had to be replaced and we needed another dump truck. If it wasn't replaced, the native plants would overwhelm my mother's plants. In their 40s, my parents completed the mulching in a long weekend. In their 50s, it took them three or four weekends to get the job done. In their 60s, they hired people to do it. When my parents started mulching, the woodchuck's hole was covered up. We couldn't leave apples anymore. I remember worrying about the woodchuck. Would he be okay? I didn't need to worry. Woodchucks dig. That's what they do. If you bury them, they dig themselves out. Today, the woodchuck lives in a new burrow under our porch. Woodchuck burrows are luxurious. They're vast. No other North American animal can make a burrow as comfortable and lush. From the point of view of other animals, the woodchuck is an industrial creature. From time to time, possums, raccoons, and other animals try to move into the woodchuck's den. They can't make anything as beautiful, so they want to take it from the woodchuck. When that happens, the woodchuck beats the living shit out of them. My basement sits right next to the porch, and when you're in the basement, you can hear the woodchuck whistling as he rips other animals' throats out. Sometimes when you see him, the scars from his battles will still be visible. A tuft of fur missing, blood on the leaves. Every now and then, neighbors try to capture and kill the woodchucks. They worry that all that digging will mess up their foundations. Sometimes they manage to snare one. When I was a kid, I worried that my woodchuck might get hurt. But you know what? Every year, I look out the window. And every year, I see a woodchuck. We think it's our backyard, but that backyard belongs to the woodchuck. We're the ones who are passing through. The woodchuck never needed our apples. He doesn't care about our mulch. He shapes the landscape as he sees fit. Other animals can only look on in jealousy or challenge him in vain. We are raccoons. We are possums. The woodchuck is the master. The idea of the good often strikes people as in some way perpendicular to nature, but the idea of the good is a human idea and humans are animals. 
the woodchuck does not just accept nature as it is. He digs, he makes burrows, he defends those burrows. He struggles to make the world a nice place for himself. He may not have the concept of the good, but he acts as if he does. His notion of the good is narrow and parochial to be sure. The woodchuck is a hedonist, interested mainly in having a comfortable burrow, eating clovers, laying out in the sun and keeping the other animals in line. But there's not much difference between his burrow and our suburb, between his clovers and our farms, between the spot where he suns himself and our resorts. The woodchuck is an industrial animal. We forget this only because he bears the appearance of a marmot. Our brains are part of the natural world and yet they conceive of values that require us to change it, to live in agony with it. Nature is in agony with itself. It is unhappy with itself. It is a realm of contradictions. It wants to be other than what it is. There is always a tension between the descriptive and the normative, between the empirical and the rational, and that tension is itself natural. Returning to nature is therefore not an escape from the contradiction of existing as part of a whole, from the feeling of lack. If we did not build like humans, we would dig like woodchucks, for they are part of nature and what they build is part of nature. And the same goes for us and for our works. Very Hegelian, substance is subject, nature is also divided. A does not equal A, yes. <laughs> um, I was just watching uh, this afternoon at Climax by Caspar Noé, uh, and it, a very similarly meditative experience, nonlinear. Um, and the rule of thumb in the film industry, if you want to get anything made, is everything has to be hyperlinear, hyperlinear, hyper, whatever. Um, follow the which you know I do, I'm not averse to, but it is interesting. I'm always I'm always um, sort of slightly jealous of these people that manage to <laughs> make make things like this and uh, convince the powers that be to support and finance them. But obviously, someone like Gaspar Noé can do whatever he wants after a certain point. But yeah, no, I do. I do like these these documentaries, these uh, man with a movie camera esque documentaries. It's a good choice, Nina. Why? Thank you. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think you know. Too, I I liked Benjamin's little meditation on the meditative. Um, no, and I mean, I think it's 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 absolutely the case that you know, we are part of nature and everything we do is natural in some very strange sense, including all of the artificial things. You know, not only does it follow from our nature, but it's part of nature, uh, you know, conceived in the, the broadest possible sense. And um, so, you know, whether we talk about nature or artifice or nature or culture or nature and history, it's, um, I mean, these are kind of handy dividing lines, but ultimately they, yeah, I don't know, point to deeper questions, I think. And I mean, you know, I was in, I'm in Athens at the moment and I went to the um, the the main museum for the Acropolis um, and they have bits of the frieze, obviously, um, that are taken, that the, you know, that Britain stole some of. Um, and they have the conflict, the sort of gigantomachy, right? So the sort of battles of the giants, which are a kind of founding myth of many cultures that you have to kind of fight this sort of greater force and you know one of the ways of maybe interpreting is is, is the relationship between kind of civilization and barbarism like how do you tame these um these sort of things that, that are bigger than you um you know whether we're thinking about like can sublime the natural sublime or you know in, in the face of which we are kind of powerless except for the fact that we have moral capacity um which in a sense gives us a, a a kind of privilege um, over nature, which we assume to be a kind of blind force, um, you know, unable to sort of uh, act in a spontaneous and therefore moral way. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I wanted to maybe get, I see what you guys thought of the, the politics um, of the film a little bit, because, you know, in, in, in my sort of brief overview, of the documentary, I was trying to say that I thought it was quite a brave film in the sense that it actually tried to present or at least frame a possible series of questions um, about the land, about nature, about um, how we might think of ourselves as a people and what it means to be um, in the same place at the same time, <laughs> in, you know, whether we're engaging in a kind of ritual or, a, you know, a, a celebration or, 
or, or something else. Um, and, you know, I thought this film was quite provocative to, to the left, to, to the portion of the left, which is, well, on the one hand, a kind of to sort of pro tech, technophilic, you know, kind of machines, science will save us, you know, um, but also to the kind of left, which is very skeptical or worried about any invocation of the land because of its, you know, presumption that this, this is, you know, the preserve of the right and that anyone who invokes the idea of place is on the side of, of the right, or that's where it would lead. And so I kind of wondered if I could ask you both a bit more about what, how you felt, found the politics of the film, if, if you saw them there or how you saw them it's it's an interesting one because um i mean i guess what i see is like the political is the is the universal of lack the fact that we yes we are part of nature but we are denatured by our second birth and that denaturing is that we experience the contradiction that marks nature at the level of our very subjectivity and that gives us the capacity for morality or the moral capacity but it's interesting you know what you're talking about so so that that's where like the universalist like dialectical universalism that like I'd be interested is and that's where I see like you know the political can be born out of but yeah at the same time we are in the same place so that's a universal thing whether we're in Timbuktu or Ireland or whatever you know that we are all have an unconscious we are all born into language and that marks all of us but yeah we all do contingently exist at a given point in a in a in the same place and sort of the, there's culture and there's all kinds of things that go along with this I think it's interesting as well like you know in terms of like the racism question um, well, there's something I could talk on. I, I was saying that um, Peter went on this this show uh, <laughs> recently, and the, the guy who runs the show, but I think kind of his catch like catchphrase is like racism is is made up or something. And that's you know there's an element of truth to that as well as the fact that also it is real because it's a way that um, it's something that's reified in order to justify the exploitation of other people, but what is used as like justificate as like an explication or like a, a material example that confirms that the reification is like not in fact like the reification but real is the contingent like uh, material conditions of a place or the culture of a place or like whether you lived close to the equator and stuff so all these markers that sort of confuse us in that sort of capitalistic ideology of, pro of promise space where we get caught up in the imaginary in order to justify an exploitation of the other and so the imaginary like it's there but is it the thing that really quote unquote matters but at the same time yeah we do you know you do have groups of people from different places at different times and say the 21st century britain is different from 19th century britain but there are some some continuums just in terms of this like um the the worry of a certain part of the quote unquote left and I put quote unquote because I in fact don't think that the capitalist left is left at all and I think that a lot of the uh, there's a lot of left wing um, in terms of this idea of the appreciation of contradiction and the universal lack the universal unconscious in conservative culture so yeah I mean I did like when I use the word left and right I can think it's like doesn't map onto the party political left and right but this hierarchy of um, you know, so land equals bad, equals past, equals fascist, is precisely the capitalistic turn, which justifies a, um, a perpetual uh, right side of history progressivism, which is in fact capitalistic, because we don't, you know, I think, I think, you know, land is one thing, and it exists, and we live in it. And why, why is it like, why do we consider it to be sort of ethically wrong to take this into consideration or that we're sort of giving the game away that we aren't globalists or something. But the promise of um, that it's better on one side of the equation. So in sort of a, an infinitely borderless world, like it could be better as in we could have a more um, moral, equitable and fair society that eventually gets built up in some kind of like more globalist world but it what we do know for sure is that that's a capitalist version of that won't be fair because you know it's, it'll just be the same but in a, a different sort of setup and this ideology of promise that capitalism hitches a ride on you know we we sacrifice the emancipatory present for a future that by definition won't come because it's a fantasy fantasy of wholeness and completeness we therefore enter into race. So when we talk about, oh, like land being racist, it's precise, the precise opposite. It's a hierarchy of promise in terms of a fantasy of a utopia, in terms of getting beyond certain things that are like, you know, 
hashtag not right or on the wrong side of history, that create racism because we require the enemies to sustain a fantasy that by definition doesn't exist because as you know, Benjamin pointed out, substance is subject, we live in a world of contradiction and we can never get the utopia. So I guess I would say that a moralistic um, future projection, I think that the moralism is the key give giveaway that there's some sort of moral hierarchy in terms of like X equals reactionary when not necessarily, you know, um, and I think that when I uh, look at what left and right is and what the political is, it's more in terms of our relationship to the acceptance of lack. And historically, yes, um, the right might have looked more conservative and the left that was challenging a system at a time might have looked less so. And I think today we can't get to a political unless we actually understand the nature of subjectivity, the nature of nature. Um, and that this sort of like moral denigration of one thing or another is a symptom of this operation of the ideology of promise, which is capitalistic. Yeah, I, as I'm listening to all of this, I'm thinking a lot about Grotius and Burke, right? Because of course, I think if, if you go back to the 18th century or the, the 17th century, in that kind of period, we associate uh, with the radical change movements, this kind of universalistic conception of nature in which there is a one natural law that is knowable, right? Uh, that states can be out of alignment with, and if they're out of alignment with it, it justifies rebellion, right? And this is something which comes out of the medieval Catholic idea of natural law, but it's been, uh, it, it's changed as it's moved into a period where there is less religious agreement and therefore less agreement over what counts as natural. So you have a lot of political theorists coming up with different iterations of what is natural law and therefore claiming rights of resistance or rejection on the parts of populations and societies where natural law is being vitiated. And Grotius always strikes me as, as the guy who is the pure example of this, making sweeping generalizations about what's natural, trying to apply them everywhere. And the thing about Grotius is land features heavily in his argument, because Grotius argues that uh, if you don't work the land, or Locke argues if you don't mix your labor with the land, then you don't have a claim on it, and that that is a, a, a natural law, right? So on the basis of that, the indigenous peoples get dispossessed because they don't work the land, right? Uh, Burke, from a more conservative standpoint, argues that what is natural is, is actually very context sensitive. If you really observe nature, what you observe is that in different places, different things are needed, different approaches are prudent, different societies in different contexts need different things. And you can't just apply one set of rules to everything and have that work out. Uh, and I think that that while both of those are motivated by a notion of the natural, and I think a kind of Augustinian rationalism would be an alternative to both of those positions, uh, that the thing that is distinctive is that these days, a lot of people who associate themselves with liberalism in position, but don't acknowledge that they have a Grotian position and disavow Grotian positions as imperialistic. Right. So if they go and read Grotius or they read Origins of International Law, you know, they go, oh, this is an imperialist justification for the oppression of indigenous people. But in terms of their substantive politics today, they tend to really like you know, human rights law. They tend to really like the idea that there is one particular way that all societies must develop and that there is one particular set of norms that everybody must follow. They're not very context sensitive. Right. So they've stripped a lot of the historical background away from that doctrine. They repudiate its background and then they continue to make the same kinds of assertions and claims in their substantive contemporary politics. It's still a very Grotian movement, the liberal left or the anarchist left. Mm -hmm. I think that's precisely right. And I think that's why that movement has to repeat patriarchy and white men as the contingent problem because it's exactly the same thing as has always been enacted. We have a huge amount of imperialism today. And I find it really funny when um, 
it's as if imperialism was only done by a certain set of countries at a certain time. It's like, have you seen the the push towards like Amazon Amazon towns today? This is like neo-colonialism on your doorstep, people. Um, but it just, you know, the, the difference is a disciplinable, um, you know, aesthetic change that's the real issue. And as long as you get rid of that, well, the same thing can persist. And it's as if, you know, it's funny because sometimes I, I have, you know, friends who, who um, might be more on the sort of liberal left and you'd be like really well versed in the arguments and stuff and you can kind of have a, an argument but it, it, and it sounds similar because maybe we're, we're re referencing the same thinkers but in different ways um but it'll always come down to as if like a friend uh, mentioned for instance a yoruba tribe who had a sort of familial relationship which had to be um annihilated by the British colonialists because it was resistant to capitalism as such. And it's like, as if whiteness in its essence or being white equals capitalism, that's just not the case. Well, and if you can make that kind of argument, then what you can say is there's nothing fundamentally wrong with making these big universal sweeping claims about how things have to develop. It's just that originally those claims were tainted with the bad ideologies, yeah. you know, the racism and the white supremacy and the sexism and misogyny and whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you get rid of those things, then you can continue to think in the same broad way. Yeah. Of course, the, the reality is whenever you do this kind of big universalist projection, you're going to take a lot of the contingent criteria of your own context and impose it in places where it doesn't apply, Absolutely. shouldn't apply, doesn't make sense. And that's going to happen regardless of where you are in history. It, uh, it's obvious to us that it doesn't make sense to do that when you're looking at norms from the 17th or 18th centuries. But a lot of people today are happy to do the same thing, provided that it's being done with 21st century terminology, norms and ideas. Yeah, I, I, I agree with um, both of what you're saying here. And I think this disavowed universalism is maybe what's sort of contested, at least at the image of the, the archive and the footage in the form of this localism. You know, and I mentioned before in previous episodes, the anti-globalization movement as it was, which was basically, you know, one of its sort of motivating aims was to oppose local cultures and, and to preserve local cultures against the homogenizing, you know, rapacious, universalizing tendencies of global capitalism. You know, that was what was being opposed. It, you know, in the name of, of, of at the same time, a kind of global image of humanity, which may or may not be predicated on lack, but, you know, let's say like a kind of, you know, uh, this assumption of the incomplete um, human that is nevertheless, uh, you know, also an object, but not the object of capital as such, you know, theref therefore there's something resistant in the human to the incursion of the, the disavowed universality of capital. And I think, so when this film presents these kind of rituals and these folk, um, you know, forms of collective behavior, you know, like the dancing, um, you know, beautiful scenes of the men dancing together, for example, um, in kind of northern villages or, or towns or, you know, the, the frankly bizarre sort of mama's plays and these kind of things, you know, and I grew up around some of that sort of thing in Wiltshire, you know, some of those folk traditions still exist. Um, and you know, there, there's something about maybe it's kind of localism that is also a potential form of resistance to the kind of, you know, the globalism that we're, we're mm -hmm. talking about. And, I, you know, and, and it's to do with its collectivity as well, like its collective nature somehow. Yeah, and so it's on interesting. This point, so oh, I, was, I was just going to say on this point. So I think one of the things that's interesting now is that people conceive of the only alternative to this kind of universalism often being an extreme anarchist localism, right? And that anarchist localism tends to itself be motivated by a kind of universalist claim about autonomy or liberty or something, right? Uh, and so it ends up becoming a different form of the same thing. The resistance becomes a different face of the thing that is being resisted, uh, where everybody is kind of a grotian and nobody can really get out from doing that. And, and I think, you know, if, if we think about some of these conservatives who are more context sensitive, like Burke, what kind of politics goes with context sensitivity? Very often, historically, it's been uh, not the kind of, of empire that we associate with the colonial imperialism of the 18th and 19th centuries, but the traditional empires, which made room for paganism and rituals and village life and so on, but were gigantic states, 
huge, gigantic, uh, multicultural, multi-ethnic states. And that those kinds of empires have really dropped out of our discourse as an option. We have people who argue that the way to get control is the nation state. We have people who argue that the way to get control is the local community, uh, that these are ways of resisting the, the universalism. But anarchism and nationalism both come out of, of modern liberalism and out of that push for a new kind of universalism. So they are, they are as forms of resistance, they are really different faces, I think, of the same beast. I mean, you talk really well, I think it was the episode, the B side of the episode we did about There Will Be Blood, about the case of the UK and the sort of dialectic of um, retaining, being able to, to quote unquote tolerate, for want of a better word, I don't think it's the, the right word, but you know, difference within a whole. Um, and that, let's say there was a, a moment, let's say post empire, uh, post the quote unquote worst of the, worst of the empire, where there was a, a possibility for this kind of reimagining of a um, dialectical whole, um, which is interesting. And I think just to, to go back to, to your point, Nina, about um, the possibility of, well, I think, you know, my, my vision of the universal and is of many others is this um, negative universal, dialectical universal of, of lack of the unconscious. But anyway, but, but there is, a, there is, something within all of us that is resistant to capitalism. And they, these, therefore, these collective, um, you know, uh, traditions can't have the capacity to reflect that negative color, because, you know, whether we're a small community or a large one, really what unites us actually is not like, you know, the fact that we all have the same color hair or whatever, but is the fact that we are all lacking speaking subjects, really. Like that's, that we live in a chaotic, we live in the chaos more, some we're sort of muddling through. Um, but the fact, I think, and I think about Northern Ireland, that a lot of local traditions are um, sneered at, are cast as immediately reactionary. Often they are reactionary because they are um, driven to being such because of the snob, you know, the, uh, the, the middle class snobbery about them, really, um, is, goes to show that potentially there is a possibility there. I was at an event recently that I went to with my, my dad and it was, you know, a very traditional kind of thing. And it really hammered home this, and she did wrote about it, I think after the, the royal wedding with, with Harry and Meghan, that these collective shows, you know, they don't have to be tied to the right or to anything reactionary. They can be a symbol of unity, of collective celebration of something we share. And the one thing that goes beyond anything that we share is, is a lack. And what better to do that, to reflect that than art, which is, the manifestation of lack in a beautiful way. Um, so yeah, and I think this, this sort of ideological disgust at certain traditions goes to show that there is something, a, a germ of something good there that needs to be squashed out in the name of capital. It, it's interesting. You're very welcome to be a traditional, to, to do traditional stuff, to do pagan stuff from a kind of new age anarchist perspective, provided that your politics are anarchist or heavily, heavily individualist anti-conformity, then you can indulge in all kinds of traditional stuff. You can LARP all kinds of stuff because it's not, your politics isn't connected to a social structure, which is the kind of social structure under which those practices could actually become widespread or, or socially meaningful. As long as your uh, connection to those kinds of things is aestheticized to the point where it has no substantive content and it doesn't actually pose any meaningful threat to the social order, it's all very welcome. So all of these attempts to bring back traditionalism or spirituality, provided that they're married to some kind of individualistic anarchism are perfectly, perfectly fine by the system. It's when you try to instantiate institutions or structures that would make those traditions robust and meaningful and have them perform a social function that you get labeled a reactionary. So it's not that, I don't think it's the actual stuff, the actual traditions, the actual rituals that are the problem for the system, but it's the attempt to instantiate the kinds of institutions and structures which would give actual meaning to those practices. And there's like a huge Orientalism around that as well. And yeah. as well, the new age thing is a highly capitalistic thing, ideology of promise, fancy of wholeness, et cetera, et cetera. So the spells and the witchiness and the crystals, perfect. Yeah. I mean, on this point about lag, though, I mean, it's very interesting in these kind of collective rituals, whether we're talking about the folk tradition or rave or, you know, all of the different things that are depicted in the footage um, in Arcadia, that um, 
there is i on the one hand of of course like this this recognition of black but it, i always think you know the ritual is also a collective attempt if you like to dissolve the self right like i mean you know the dionysian dionysus obviously worshipped in 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 athens you know he's he's the most popular guy you know he, he represents vegetation and wine and the phallus and you know he's accompanied by satyrs and you know we, we know who dionysus is in a way he always looks a bit demonic and naughty and but but one of the things you know Nietzsche talks about this in the birth of tragedy is is what the Dionysian is about is this kind of dissolution of the self in a collective extra ecstatic uh, feeling whether we're talking about um, performance of art or theatre or um, uh, you know something more bacchanal like a, a kind of drunken symposium or a party or um, you know a rave really and I think that kind of there's something about the experience of that collectivity and you can get it too on protest, right? It doesn't have to be some village, you know, barn dance, it, you know, you can, it, it, you, you experience it in moments of collective uh, belonging, right? So that, that is, is not itself complete, but actually what it does is dissolve, let's say all of the kind of alienated or you know or partly does it, it it temporarily removes you from the the horror of being an individual <laughs> you know like because there is something like unbearable about being an individual yeah. all the time like it's horrific and especially if this is like this kind of atomized individual and you have to make up your own morality because there's no traditional structures to do it for you and then you have to have an identity and then you have to have a self and and then it's like oh my god what a lot of work you know <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this is tiring stuff, you know, and and so the idea of being able to sort of in a in a kind framework, you know, maybe a, maybe a raucous framework, maybe a, a framework that occasionally gets out of hand and gets a bit rowdy and a bit sexual or whatever is 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 always going to um, be a big, uh, I don't know, a big part of human yeah. existence, you know. I think it's interesting because this reminds me of the axe, the ick dress, you know, because <laughs> obviously, you know, we have this dialectic of identity, like we need an ego to navigate the world, but then also capitalism, we are individuals, but we we get um, rendered the same in our separateness. So there's, you know, that the, the, there is a dissolution of the self in uh, in capitalism but yeah it's a separate self a separate sort of like all ice cubes in a little box or something there's a phrase that um some of my american friends say about mary berry uh, is she mary berry in uh in the bake-off which is like um it's like a line of little soldiers you know like little piece little biscuits cut out exactly the same anyway but um but then at the same time so we do need a sense of self and not having a sense of self always could, you know let's say if it's the psychotic experience or you know an anxious experience could lead to a frantic attempt to instantiate a self or an ego and the search for identity today but I completely agree that you know in terms of at times we have this sort of in and out this sort of flow of this we do need times to sort of relax and to, to break down boundaries and stuff and to go back to the Gaspar Noe film I was just watching it on my laptop but like I was thinking about in the cinema you know a lot of his films are about you know LSD and all this kind of stuff I'm not somebody who thinks there's like emancipatory potential in LSD but you know these collect you know there's something in in the cinema you know it collectively made made with huge teams of people watched in a in an environment that is you know very visceral with the noise and the colors and all the different people who are watching it with you um there's something beyond language about cinema the language of the image which is universal you know so so there is something universal about about film as such but then also just about like a lot of these things you know you're talking about the rave you're like these are these are like uncapitalizable upon experiences right you know and there's a recognition of lack in sacrifice it's a lack of a so lack generates excess. You know, it's not one thing or the other. We have excess, excess jouissance because of our lack, but also this recognition that we need sacrifice in order to generate desire, and that you know, without the sacrifice, we 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 just are in this road to nowhere. But we need constructive sacrifice, and so this sort of Dionysian thing is this absolute like knowledge that we need things that are wasteful, that are non-utilitarian, that aren't just capitalized upon. And as soon as they become capitalized upon, they become that which they aren't, you know, they become alienated, even the, even the thing itself. I think about, you know, art often, maybe alienated art or alienating art or art that isn't really art is when it has this utilitarian purpose often, not always, but yeah. Have yeah, you guys... I mean, you... Go oh, I was just gonna say, have, are you guys familiar with Osho, the Indian guru? This, uh, this guru from India who 
started an ashram uh, in, in India and then got into conflict with the Indian government and attempted to relocate the ashram to the United States in the 80s. Is this the, what, the one that the Netflix documentary is about? The Wild World, yeah, whatever yeah. it is, yeah. I only started that, I didn't finish it, but yeah. Yeah, he goes and buys this huge estate, this huge ranch outside of a town in Oregon. And the Oregonians don't like him because he has this reputation for being uh, very sexually emancipated, a lot of free love, uh, and, and they're worried about that. And they try to prevent him from building his city on this, this ranch because the ranch isn't zoned for a city, it's zoned uh, as a ranch. And so then he tries to buy up all of the uh, uh, houses in a neighboring small town because the town is incorporated. So if he, he can't have a city on the ranch, he will buy up a, a city that is small enough that his people have enough money to be able to, uh, to eat it, right? Uh, and it's interesting because the, the reason I mention it is that there are a lot of people who are joining his ashram because they want this kind of loss of ego experience. But the Osho's own philosophy is highly uh, irreligious in many respects. He, he disputes the existence of God. He is constantly uh, telling people not to listen to authorities. He's, it's very anarchist. His own spiritual uh, philosophy is very anarchist, but he attracts a huge number of people who all wear the same colored outfits and they follow him wherever he goes, right? And so on the one hand, there's this, this sense that Osho's followers are a kind of cult and they get compared a lot to the Jim Jones followers who uh, only a few years earlier had committed mass suicide. Yet at the same time, the substantive philosophy of Osho is highly individualist, highly anarchistic, right? Uh, and at one point when he was in India, somebody tried to kill him. And the person who tried to kill him tried to kill him because he believed that Osho was a CIA agent trying to make India more like the United States because Osho would require his followers to work because he wanted the ashram to, to make a lot of money so that it could continue to exist and continue to expand. And it's because he ran the ashram like it was a business that it came into enough money that he could purchase that ranch and try to buy up that town and, and all the rest of it. And so, yeah, you, know, you guys are talking about raves, which are a more ordinary instance of this. But I, I think there's, there's a lot of, kind of anarchist flavored, individualist flavored attempts to revive this as a commercial product. And since Osho died, there's a foundation associated with him and the foundation you know, sells meditation courses, it sells all kinds of stuff and it has a huge re meditation resort on the site of the original ashram. And the, the, I think that the trouble is that this, this desire to have the kind of ritual, oftentimes the ritual is an alternative to getting there the hard way, getting there through philosophical engagement. And so a lot of people who are unable to get there on their own, try to get there through some kind of ritual in a group. And that's a fleeting experience. In the moment, it, it gives you this glimpse of getting beyond ego, but it doesn't actually get you there. And so what you instead get is a bunch of people who are kind of paying to be proximate so that they might get it. And I think the guru himself had to a large degree, uh, you know, uh, did I think take a lot of his own beliefs and ideas seriously. A lot of his followers want to take them seriously or want to believe the ideas. Uh, at what point the, the guru says that he doesn't like the relationship between master and student, and he would have preferred to have been a friend to all of these people rather than their master, but they aren't ready to accept him as a friend, and therefore he has to be their master, right? Uh, so on some level, he's aware, and yet he would not be able to build his city on the ranch if they weren't treating him like a master, and if they weren't following him around and doing whatever jobs his people tell them to do. So it's it's a strange mix of, of, on the one hand, this kind of ritualistic ego dissolving experience. And on the other hand, uh, it's the fact that people are desperate to have the ego dissolved and want to have it dissolved 
uh, because they still have an ego that drives the whole thing and enables it to become what it is. And I think that's the trick in under capitalism. It's to find ways of, of marketizing rituals so that the, the dissolution of the ego is, is never quite there. Uh, it's, it's always just a little bit further away. Well, this is but, the ideology of promise, isn't it? Like right. if, you, if you, you can put, if you, you can, uh, you can turn it, capitalize on anything. If there's a promise to, if, if you like the, uh, I honestly believe that the only thing that's anti-capitalist is accepting lack. Like if you believe that dis dissolving the ego is going to make you whole and complete capitalism, like just is. And what was I going to say? Yeah, so it can be anything. And yeah, we see it so much today with the new age stuff, highly capitalistic. It's just like, if you believe it's going to change you, do the drugs, do the meditation, might help you a little bit, but it's not going to like transform your universe and take you out of the antagonism. Anyway, we're over an hour, so we've got to wrap up. We're going to go do the B side. Thank you guys so much for listening. We hope you'll join us on Patreon for that B side. Uh, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.